Well, I want to <clears throat> welcome all of you uh, this afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Abraham Kim. I'm the Vice President for the Korea Economic Institute. Uh, we're really honored today uh, to have Dr. Wanyuk Lim, who currently serves as the Director of Global Economy Research at the Korea Development Institute. Uh, he's written extensively on state-owned uh, enterprises, family-based business groups, uh, better known as Chebols, and international development issues. <clears throat> I think all of you have his bios, his bio in front of you, so I won't go into too much detail about his uh, distinguished background. Uh, but I want all I want to mention here today is that he is one of the leading and accomplished economic scholars in Korea, and he's a longtime friend of the K Korea Economic Institute and has been on our advisory council for many, many years uh, advising KEI. Uh, today, he'll be sharing his perspective on some of the economic and political opportunities and challenges for President Park Geun-hye's administration. Uh, as all of you know, this is a very timely topic. Uh, to set the stage as we look ahead to President Park's visit in a few weeks uh, here in, in the United States. And as she now focuses on the task of setting the agenda for her new administration and tackling uh, governance issues. Uh, after Dr. Lim's presentation, we've invited Scott Snyder, uh, Senior Fellow and Director of the pro of Program on the Program of U.S. Korea Policy at uh, Council on Foreign Relations to say a few comments. Uh, then we will take questions and answer from you, the audience. And then, uh, uh, and then we'll end our program uh, by 1 o'clock, uh, excuse me, 1.30. Uh, I'm also reminded that this program is also live streamed. So we also have a, uh, a, a, a larger audience in the virtual world. And we welcome you, uh, the virtual audience. And if you would like to submit questions to our speaker during the Q&A session, uh, please submit your questions through Twitter uh, to uh, at Korea. Econ uh, I A I N S T. That's K O R E A E C O N I N S T. And with that, uh, please help me welcome Dr. Wanyuk Lim to the podium. Okay. Uh, thanks for the uh, nice introduction. As uh, as Dr. Kim said, I have been serving as a member on the uh, advisory council for KEI for more than ten years, and I also spent some time in D.C. as a CNF fellow at Brookings in 2005 and six. So it's uh, nice to be uh, to be back in D.C. and talk about some of the key challenges that Korea faces. And initially, when I was uh, discussing this idea about giving a talk at KEI, we were. Uh, 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 Dr. Kim and I were uh, uh, thinking that it would be a good idea to focus on economic challenges that Korea faces, given my uh, economics background. But uh, North Korea has a way of disrupting your best laid plans, and uh, I thought uh, there would be a lot of interest in North Korea-related issues as well as uh, political issues, especially with uh, President Park geun -hye's, uh forthcoming visit and the summit with uh, President uh, Barack Obama on May 7th. So what I'd like to do today is to actually cover a totality, the totality of uh, uh, political, economic, and uh, diplomatic challenges that Korea faces as a middle power at this stage, and to lay out some of the uh, opportunities that uh, the Park administration has. Okay. So if I just press this. Okay. Okay. Okay, since I'm uh, covering a lot of ground, um, what I'd like to do is to give you a, a table of contents uh, layout for the presentation itself. And uh, this I'd like to make it available to the audience. And also there's a background paper on uh, only the economic challenges, uh, inclusive growth challenges that Korea faces, uh, which I would also like to make available. In the presentation today, uh, uh, I'd like to start with uh, Korea's position in the world, an overview of Korea's position in the world. So I'll go with Korea's endowment, uh, what kind of population, you know, size and location and so on. And then just have a very brief uh, talk, of, uh, 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 perspective on Korea's economic and political development over the past you know, 30 or 40, uh, 40 years. And then go to changing international landscape and, and add a regional dimension to it, especially with uh, uh, respect to Asia's resurgence. And, uh, and then conclude the first section with uh, Korea's positioning strategies in Asia and beyond. Uh, 
And then uh, I'll go to uh, economic and political outlook for Korea. So, you know, short term forecasts for Korea's uh, economic challenges at, as well as political challenges after the uh, presidential election in 2012. With respect to the political cha challenges, what I'd like to do is to compare uh, two elections, two presidential elections in 2012 and 2002 to highlight some of the uh, uh, generational and uh, regional features of those two elections and what, what they uh, imply for uh, the, the politics uh, in the future. And finally, I'll conclude the presentation with uh, future challenges. Uh, growth slowed down economically, uh, increasing income inequality, uh, aging, social welfare, and finally, uh, last but not least, uh, North Korea. So let me get on with this. Okay. Well, as you know, Korea is located in Northeast Asia. It's a divided land bridge in uh, Northeast Asia. And if you actually look at territorial area, uh, reunified Korea would be slightly uh, smaller than Britain, and South Korea alone would be similar to uh, Portugal. Uh, as far as population is concerned, reunif reunified Korea is actually larger than uh, France. And uh, uh, South Korea alone is similar to Spain in uh, uh, population. And it's a resource-poor resource but uh, people-rich country, uh, uh, as you see. And uh, given that it is a divided land bridge in Asia, uh, maritime continental confrontation would increase the risks of uh, military conflict on the peninsula. And, and what Korea has to do geopolitically is to promote, actually, cooperation between maritime and continental powers so as to minimize such risks of uh, military conflict on the peninsula. And uh, on the global stage, Korea's cred credibility comes from the fact that that's a track record of economic and political development and lack of imperialistic aggre aggression. And that uh, really is the credibility of Korea as a middle power. Uh, economically, uh, Korea went from about 12% uh, of the United States in, uh, in per capita GDP terms uh, at power, uh, purchasing power parity in 1970 to about 26% in 1987 when Korea was democratized. And uh, Korea is at, is at about 64% uh, of the United States uh, at, uh, in, in terms of uh, per capita income. And politically, um, as you know, uh, Korea has now become a democracy. And one way to look at it is that uh, back in 1972, when the Yushin Constitution was adopted, uh, Freedom House rated Korea in the same league as Iran, Ethiopia, and Zimbabwe. And uh, you know, about 30 years later, in uh, 2010, uh, Korea is in the same league as uh, such Western countries as uh, Italy and Japan. So uh, political development was no less significant and dramatic than uh, uh, economic development. And as far as uh, international landscape is concerned, uh, what's happening is, uh, as you must have heard many times, uh, dramatic power shifts. Uh, back in 2000, uh, the G7 countries uh, accounted for about 65% uh, of the world's GDP at market exchange rates. But now uh, the, the share is down to about 50%. And uh, uh, especially the relative decline of the United States and Japan uh, 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 is pronounced uh, on that front. So although Western powers have, uh, Western countries have uh, uh, surged ahead, surged ahead since the uh, Industrial Revolution, there's something of uh, convergence taking place on the global stage with uh, the emergence of, uh, or resurgence of uh, developing countries. And this has a, a regional dimension in that not every region is uh, uh, catching up with the West. In fact, Asia since 1960 uh, is, is, uh, is really the only uh, region that has managed to narrow the development gap with the West. And uh, according to the Asia Development Bank's um, uh, Asia 2050, realizing the Asian, Asian century that was published in 2011, uh, you know, there, there may be Asian century scenario and middle income scenario, but uh, the, the baseline scenario is that Asia will, uh, will surge ahead in terms of its uh, economic influence and political influence. But this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this has some uh, risk as well, and the way I usually think about this is that 
uh, I draw two axes. Uh, on the vertical axis, I draw uh, internal reform. And on the, uh, on the horizontal axis, I uh, draw uh, external cooperation. And then you'll have a two by two matrix and uh, four possibilities. And what we often call Asian century um, uh, uh, entails internal reform as well as external cooperation in Asia. So Asian countries carry out internal reform to upgrade their economies and improve social cohesion. Uh, but at the same time, Asian countries and extra regional powers such as the United States successfully manage changing international power dyna dynamics and achieve greater cooperation. So that's the best scenario for Asia. But then uh, in the middle income uh, trap, uh, internal reform doesn't take place. And what I have on the left hand side, uh, you have much less external cooperation. So in the uh, perilous prosperity scenario, Asian countries carry out internal reform, but they fail to manage uh, changing international power dynamics. So even though they achieve prosperity, but it, uh, it, is, uh, it is perilous. And finally, the last uh, sort of nightmare scenario is uh, crisis and conflict, where internal reform and external cooperation don't really take place. So uh, these are the scenarios I uh, often have in, my, I, I have in mind about Asia. And given these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, conditions, Korea's positioning strategies um, are, are, are as follows. Try to uh, build a coalition uh, based on the uh, ROK-US alliance and inclusive regional cooperation. So instead of having just the uh, China-centric uh, regional cooperation or US-centric regional cooperation as uh, embodied in uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, or uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific uh, Trans Partnership, respectively, uh, EAS, the East Asian Summit, which is inclusive of, uh, of the two powers, would be uh, much more in line with Korea's uh, global uh, strategy. And multilateral diplomacy has to be a big part of uh, that co coalition building strategy. And given Korea's economic development, uh, its leadership role in um, sustainable development and green growth, crisis prevention and management and so on, I think Korea has a lot to offer. Uh, both politically, economically, and security-wise on the global stage. So uh, going forward uh, with the uh, summit coming up on May 7th, I think uh, this has to be the background of, the, uh, of Korea's role on the global stage as uh, Korea and the uh, uh, United States uh, uh, try, uh, try to enhance the, uh, the alliance. Okay. Now let me move to more short-term forecasts for uh, economic and political outlook. It, you know, Eurozone crisis is, uh, has, has been showing a stop-and-go pattern for the past five years or so. So you know, it, we, we, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty with this uh, forecast. But bottom line is that uh, this year uh, in Korea, we are looking at about 2.8% growth uh, with the supp a supplemental budget. Uh, that uh, has just been pre uh, pre presented. And uh, without the, the budget, supplemental budget, uh, some officials fear that the uh, uh, Korea's GDP growth this year would be as low as 2.3%. So, you know, uh, for people used to uh, uh, economic growth rate of 6%, uh, 7%, and so on, it's a, it's a letdown, but on the, uh, on the global stage, uh, this is not uh, doing so bad. Uh, politically, one thing we have to look at is what the uh, presidential election means uh, for the future of Korean politics. And as I, I mentioned at the outset, I think the best way to do that would be to compare the uh, 2012 election with the 2002 election. And uh, I, uh, I summarized the, the key features of, uh, of this. And one way to think about this is that the impact of population aging. Okay. Back in 2002, uh, you know, the share of the people 50 years or uh, 50, 50 years of age or above um, was only about 27 percent. Okay. But then in uh, in uh, 2012, uh, that share increased to about 40 percent. Okay. So. Uh, what we have by 2012 is a pretty much 20%, 20%, 20%, 20 20% breakdown for, for the uh, five age groups. Uh, and so that's a dramatic change from the 2002 election. So population aging 
has played a great role. And if you look at uh, 2012 election uh, by age group and look at, the, uh, look at what is called the share gap, uh, what, what you do is uh, you multiply the population share of the uh, age group, so the voter share, multiply that by uh, voting rate, uh, how, how, how much they vote, and then uh, you uh, multiply that by the support gap between uh, the, uh, the voters who supported uh, Park Geun-hye on the one hand and Moon Jae-in on the other, you can just calculate the share gap. Okay. And uh, for, uh, for the age group uh, in their 20s and below, the share gap was minus 3.8%, meaning that in that age group, uh, in that age group the, uh, Moon Jae-in en enjoyed a 3.8% advantage over Park Geun-hye. And uh, 30, uh, age group in, the, uh, in their 30s was about 4.9% in favor of Moon Jae-in. Uh, in their 40s was 2.0% uh, in favor of Moon, uh, Moon Jae-in as well. But then there was a dramatic uh, swell of support among uh, voters in their 50s and uh, uh, above. So 4.3% and 7.3% and add it up, they, uh, uh, they together overwhelm the support that Moon Jae-in enjoyed in the, uh, in the 20s to 40s age groups. And uh, then you get to ask, given the share gap patterns in 2002, uh, what really dominated, uh, you know, cohort effect or the vintage effect, and both seem to be taking place a little bit. Uh, in fact, voters in their 50s who had been split equally in 2002 strongly supported the conservative candidate in 2012. So voters in their 50s in 2012 uh, favored Park geun uh, by 4.3%, uh, but these people these voters were in their 40s in uh, 2002 election, and they were uh, split equally among uh, you know, uh, Roh Mu Hyun and Lee Hwe Chang at the time. So there was uh, something of a vintage effect as well as a cohort effect, and uh, uh, this kind of uh, generational gap, gap has uh, some important implications going forward. Okay. Uh, as far as the region is concerned, I think the, uh, the disparity, so regional polarization has declined somewhat. So it's much more likely to, uh, that you get flips uh, you know, from the conservative side to the progressive side and vice versa in regions. So there's, there's been some cro progress regionally, but generational gap has, uh, has uh, increased actually. And uh, as far as, the, uh, as, as, far as uh, President Park Geun-hye's leadership style is concerned, I think it's important to remember that you know, she was, see, she was born in 1952, so she was only uh, 22 years old when uh, her mother, the First Lady Yu gyeong soo was uh, assassinated. And, uh, and uh, President Park, uh, Park, Park Jong-hee was assassinated uh, five years later. And she suffered, you know, what is commonly called betrayal trauma, uh, not only from the former followers of uh, President Park Jong-hee, but also from her family members and so on. So she has some problem uh, dealing with, uh, with people. Um, she also has something of an authoritarian s streak, but she also has a great mass appeal, uh, especially among older voters. And she's probably the best, gen uh, best politician in her generation about uh, catching the mood of the general, pop, uh, general uh, voters. So as you remember, when the uh, Grand National Party was defeated in the Seoul mayoral election in 2011, um, she was, the, she was the, you know, one of the first uh, conservative politicians to actually read the mood of the uh, voters and did everything to transform the party. For instance, changing the color of the logo from blue to red in Seoul. And she also uh, took the initiative and made, uh, made economic democratization key part of her uh, campaign uh, platform and so on. So she, she's, she's very, very good in that, uh, in that regard. But there, there are some, uh, uh, some problems with the way she uh, interacts with people. And as you know, uh, cre uh, she has had some problems with, the, uh, uh, some problems with nominations. So uh, it, it's fairly apparent that what happened was that she would nominate some person based on his or her presentation at a seminar that she attended, uh, and she got a you know, good impression of 
uh, of that person. But then, you know, background check wasn't wasn't uh, wasn't very uh, very uh, very good, and she had to retract, or at least the, the nominees had to uh, resign um, uh, on on some occasions. And there was some concern uh, early in his term about uh, President Park Geun Hye having just dinner alone by herself, just being a loner that way. But then more recently, she is, she's beginning to open up and uh, she's inviting uh, politicians, both from the ruling party and the, uh, and the, and the opposition party and engage, uh, uh, engaging in dinner politics. And you know, dinner politics, presidential dinner politics being what it is, it plays similar to, uh, 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 to the United States. You know, President Obama invites Republicans and uh, uh, kind of talks about uh, the key issues that he has and the uh, uh, politicians here talk about the local issues and so on. So she, she's, uh, she's improving quite, uh, quite quickly um, uh, in that regard. And I think uh, politics being what it is in Korea is, in, is very much in flux, but I think she's, uh, she's turned a corner uh, uh, at, uh, uh, in early April uh, with regard to just the uh, communication aspects of politics. Now, uh, future challenges for Korea. Okay, growth slowdown is on the uh, minds of uh, Korean electorate. And uh, as you see from this, uh, this graph, the potential GDP growth rate has uh, been uh, declining. And, uh, and we at KDI expect uh, or uh, uh, project about three to four percent potential GDP rate for, for the next 10 years or so. So even based on that, 2.3 percent or 2.8 percent growth is not, not that high. But you know, there are some growth challenges going forward. Uh, but at the same time, if we take a more historical and comparative perspective, you see that low-income countries in 1962, uh, middle-income countries in 1962, and high-income countries in 1962 all grew at about 2.0% uh, uh, in terms of per capita income over the next half century. Okay. So 2% growth in, in terms of per capita income, 2% uh, 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 growth for per capita income is not low uh, by any means on global stage. But as you see in this cell, uh, Korea is used to being a, 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 an exceptional performer. So 2% growth uh, in terms of per capita income is not going to satisfy Korean people. And there's always this risk of instead of, uh, instead of just boosting productivity and doing it the right way, uh, po policymakers may be uh, tempted to just, uh, just boost the economy no matter what and actually create a bubble in the asset market or things of that nature. So there's always that, that risk, but at the end of the day, uh, 2% growth, uh, uh, comparatively, is not such a bad performance. Okay. Now, this graph comes from um, uh, a paper by Takeo Hoshi and Anil Kashyap in 2011 titled, uh, Why Did Japan Stop Growing? And here, what they, sh what they look at is they have per capita income levels uh, from 10,000 all the way to 40,000, and then look at the uh, uh, growth of per capita income for the G7 countries. And what you see is that uh, United States is actually doing quite well, uh, even beyond $30,000 per capita income. It's growing at about 2% um, uh, rate annually, so it's doing quite well. But if you look at Japan, uh, its per capita income grew at 3.5% uh, when its per capita income was about $20,000. But then its growth uh, decelerated dramatically, and then it sort of plateaued at 1.0%, okay? But if you look at countries like Italy, uh, growth deceleration is even more dramatic. And many people in Korea uh, these days are concerned about uh, Korea following in the footsteps of Japan, given population aging and uh, uh, competition from emerging countries and so on. So this is gonna be a, a big challenge down the road. And, uh, and and the, the next big challenge is uh, income inequality. Korea, on the whole, is still 
you know, relatively uh, equitable country, uh, but Gini coefficient has increased over time, as, as you see somewhat, especially since the uh, economic crisis. And when you actually look at relative poverty rates, uh, Korea is not a, uh, not, a, not a good performer within the OECD region. In, in fact, its relative poverty rate is higher than the OECD average. And uh, uh, income inequality, likewise, is higher than the OECD average. Okay. So there are some concerns about uh, inequality. And another thing that's important is uh, population aging, as I mentioned. And it showed up in the uh, presidential election result of 2012, as we saw. And uh, Korea in 2009 was the fourth uh, youngest country in the OECD. But it is going to be the second oldest country uh, in the OECD region by 2050. So the population uh, aging is accelerating at, a, at a, a dramatic rate, and it's a serious problem. And uh, social welfare, given the population aging and uh, uh, income disparities and so on, demand for social welfare is increasing, and that's part of the reason why uh, President Park Geun-hye was so, uh, uh, so proactive in championing economic democratization uh, during the, uh, d during the uh, election campaign. And uh, 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 to keep uh, government debt at about 60% of GDP in 2050, tax burden uh, has to increase quite, uh, quite a bit, from about 26% in uh, 2010 to about 34% by 2050. It's not impossible, but you know, there are some uh, figures that we have to keep in mind. And social expenditure in Korea is uh, still relatively low uh, compared with the uh, OECD average. So there's pent up demand for social welfare. And uh, last but not least, there's North Korea. Uh, as you see from this uh, table, uh, ROK or South Korea is about, uh, 17, has about 17 times per capita income of North Korea. Uh, twice the population of North Korea, so the GDP uh, is about 36 times of uh, North Korea. But, you know, uh, this uh, economic uh, uh, disparity between South Korea and North Korea is only one of the uh, concerns that South Koreans have. And as you know, uh, uh, most recently, uh, nuclear crisis flared up once again. And back in 2005, uh, Morton Abramovitz and, uh, and uh, Steve uh, Bosworth wrote a book uh, called uh, Chasing the Sun um, uh, on U.S. foreign policy toward uh, East Asia. And there they talk about the uh, you know, uh, North Korea policy and uh, the, the phrase I remember from that section is a remake of a bad movie. Uh, it just, you know, 1994 with the Geneva Agreement. Uh, 2002, 2000, 2003, another crisis, uh, 2005, 2006, 2007, another crisis, and so on. And, uh, and what, what seems to be happening is as the Bush administration and the, Clinton, uh, and the Ob Obama administration have uh, engaged in what is, what is called strategic patience, things are getting sort of out of control. Um, as far as North Korea is concerned, it's quite clear what they want. I mean, they seem to be going for broke and going for brinkmanship, but they uh, almost always have an, uh, have an exit open. And they try to carry the logic of deterrence to its extreme. So if they feel that the threat is coming from the United States, uh, the logic of deterrence mandates or requires that they develop nuclear missile capability that, has, uh, that can reach the United States. Um, that, that's sort of the uh, technical, logical approach uh, that they seem to have in mind. And uh, they, want, uh, they want to have uh, uh, cake and eat it too in that uh, on March 31st, they specifically said uh, they want to pursue in parallel military strength and economic prosperity, nuclear uh, capability and economic development. And uh, India, Pakistan, and uh, Israel model, where you are you know, de facto recognized as a, a nuclear state and also uh, has uh, in, uh, reasonable relations with the outside world to pursue economic uh, and other development. That, I think, is uh, what they have in mind. Okay? That's the maximum uh, that, they, uh, that they have in mind. It's not clear what the United States has in mind. Uh, I, I uh, often ask this question to my American 
uh, uh, colleagues and friends, uh, where's the red line uh, when uh, the United States deals with uh, North Korea? Because back in 1994, if you think about it, uh, when you know, uh, de then uh, Defense Secretary William Perry uh, talked about the possibility of uh, uh, bombing North Korean nuclear reactor, nuclear facilities, it was clear that the red line was at uh, plutonium reprocessing and missile tests. And because uh, this red line was not you know, set in stone, United States subsequently engaged in a diplomacy as well as the threat of the use of force to uh, sustain the red line and make it credible. Okay. But after the uh, collapse of the agreed framework, uh, Geneva agreed framework, it, it's, not, it's not so clear where the red line is. You know, North Korea has conducted uh, three nuclear tests but there's no real you know, reaction to that. And uh, it's uh, conducted some missile tests as well. So uh, uh, many people sort of presume that the implicit red line is uh, non-proliferation. And oftentimes we think that's just the non-proliferation in the Middle East. So if North Koreans, for instance, uh, hand over nuclear material to Iran or some terrorists in the Middle East, uh, then they really are breaching the uh, red line and the United States will respond. But if you think about it, a non-proliferation is not just a regional problem uh, limited to the Middle East. There's also a non-proliferation problem in East Asia uh, with uh, Japan, Japan possibly going uh, nuclear, South Korea possibly going uh, nuclear in response to uh, North Korea's uh, becoming a nuclear state. So, you would think that non-proliferation in the Middle East and uh, East Asia constitutes uh, uh, the red line currently, but not, nothing is really clear uh, at this point. And I, I, I personally think the starting point for negotiation, renewed negotiation with North Korea would be three no's, uh, as suggested by Sig Hacker. You know, no more bombs, no better bombs, and no exports, so that the uh, nuclear missile capability uh, that North Korea is trying to develop is capped at the current level and you know you engage in negotiation and see where there's an overlap of interest between uh, North Korea and the outside world. As far as China's concerned it's almost like do as I say not as I do g given you know it has it developed China developed its own nuclear weapons and uh, normalized relations with the outside world in the 70s, and then, uh, and, and then pursued economic development, you know, stage by stage. Uh, that's what they did, but you know, China doesn't actually say, uh, doesn't pres prescribe that kind of approach to uh, North Korea, but rather you know, they make it very clear that uh, new, uh, uh, denuclearized uh, uh, Korean Peninsula is one of their objectives. So in many ways, uh, China is happy to keep North Korea afloat and expand China's uh, economic influence in North Korea. But there's a limit to that uh, to a certain extent because if North Korea is, uh, has, uh, it becomes a full-fledged nuclear state, it may trigger uh, proliferation in East Asia, especially with uh, Japan going nuclear. So there's, a, there's some limit to what China can tolerate and if you think about it, uh, there's a very, uh, th there's an uh, intersection of interests uh, between the United States and China to keep uh, uh, East Asia or keep non-proliferation in East Asia uh, a, an ongoing proposition. And the nightmare scenario for the Korean people is for the United States and China to s somehow cut a deal and, uh, and, uh, and uh, do something about North Korea before things are, uh, get out of control and uh, uh, Japan and South Korea both go nuclear or something like that. So that's the, that's the nightmare scenario, but uh, at the moment the uh, probability of that is not very high and China I think is still happy to keep North Korea afloat and expand its economic influence in North Korea while uh, North Korea is getting isolated. So it, it really depends uh, on your perspective in many ways. Now then what to do with, uh, uh, with North Korea going uh, forward? I, I think if you look at Geneva Agreed Framework and its sequels, it's predicated on the premise that it's possible to have complete verifiable irrevers irreversible dismantlement of uh, 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 nuclear facilities, nuclear weapons and so on. Uh, 
in exchange for complete, verifiable, irreversible normalization of relations uh, between North Korea and the uh, United States and uh, the outside world. But I mean, if you think about it, is anything in life really complete, verifiable, and irreversible other than death? Um, and as uh, people like Evans Revere uh, pointed out recently at a, a, Brookings, uh, a Brookings seminar, it would be very difficult to verify uh, what's going on in North Korea, especially with uh, uranium enrichment and everything. So I think a, a better approach would be to verify what you can and what you must, especially long-range missile capability, plutonium processing, and so on. And, uh, and recognize that both North Korea and the United States do not trust each other, and they are likely to hedge. And, but change fact, try to change facts on the ground by expanding uh, interaction between the two sides and between North Korea and the outside world. Uh, by just focusing on uh, nuclear weapons on the, uh, from the security angle, I think uh, progress would be very limited going, uh, going forward. And 20 years, uh, experience over the, uh, 20 years experience teaches us the, the limits of that approach. Okay. Uh, so, and as far as uh, Korea's uh, uh, global role is concerned, as I mentioned, it's, it's become a middle power and uh, it, it, uh, a, a formerly developing country has become an advanced economy. And the big question is how should its policy change and how should its positioning strategy change. And uh, Korea, in many ways, is going through something of an identity crisis. You know, there's a proverbial uh, uh, frog not remembering its days as a tadpole uh, in Korea. And oftentimes we hear Korea is a bridge between developing and developed countries, but closer to which side? And how much of the established uh, global standards should Korea accept? And how much should it try to change as an insider or outsider? And uh, uh, whether it's uh, possible to stay, stay, go status shopping between uh, developing countries, uh, developing country on the one hand and developed country on the other. Uh, those are the questions that, uh, that face Korean policymakers going forward. And I'll just conclude today's presentation with a, a quote from uh, 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 Kim Gu, uh, who was the president of the provisional government of Korea. And going forward, I, I think this, this sentiment really has to, has to guide Korea's uh, middle power diplomacy if it's going to be an honest uh, interlocutor between the developing and developed world. The key point here is that instead of trying to become the, the, the richest or the most powerful or the uh, wealthiest uh, country, uh, uh, Kim Gu wanted Korea to become the most beautiful nation and uh, de uh, desired in infinite quantity the power of a highly developed culture. And of, of course, that has to be backed by you know, geopolitical assets and uh, economic assets and so on. But I think that has to be the key sentiment that guides Korean poli policymakers going forward as, it, as they try to carve out a uh, middle power role for Korea. Thank you very much. For a very comprehensive presentation, um, you know, really just a, um, a remarkable covering of a tour de raison uh, of some of the challenges that uh, South Korea faces and some of the opportunities that South Korea faces. Uh, it's really hard to know how to even begin to provide some additional uh, comment on the paper. One thing I want to just highlight, though, is that a lot of the data in this presentation, I think, draws uh, directly on um, Wanyuk's work uh, at KDI and really uh, some very um, heavy lifting in terms of thinking about uh, and uh, implementing ways for South Korea to be more active in the global context. And so I just want to acknowledge that because I think that's very important work. Uh, he's really at the forefront, I think, of a lot of the emergence of, of South Korea that we see in a lot of the functional areas. Uh, he's been doing work with the World Bank and also uh, especially in the context of thinking about South Korea's development strategy uh, and um, uh, roles for uh, emerging new donors. 
um, uh, in the international development context. And that's very important. It's really critical as one thinks about uh, how South Korea has positioned itself um, uh, and opportunities going forward. I, I think probably the best thing that I can do um, uh, as a way of focusing a discussion uh, on the presentation uh, is simply to point out uh, that for me there were six big questions uh, that uh, were raised uh, in the course of uh, the presentation. Uh, and I'm going to try to address them in, in, in uh, order of the presentation. Uh, the first one that I thought was fascinating, and I'm almost tempted to try to get this graph back up here, but you know this graph about Asian alternative scenarios that he laid out near the beginning. Uh, essentially, it had four quadrants uh, imagining uh, what was called perilous prosperity, crisis and conflict, middle income trap, or Asian century as possible scenarios. What I find very interesting about that graph is that um, there are some things that South Korea can do to help realize uh, the Asian century the, to, to get into the best quadrant, but a lot depends on what the neighbors do. Uh, and we know that um, President Park is coming here with a Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Initiative that she seems to be placing uh, as a centerpiece uh, for her foreign policy. And so, you know, the question that I'm going to be watching going forward is um, how does she move that forward given the level of dependency uh, that it requires on statesmanship by other political actors? Uh, in the region. And so that's one issue I think that uh, Wan Hyuk's presentation raised. Uh, a second one uh, that I think is very interesting is really as South Korea uh, emerges uh, as a middle power, um, is a very interesting challenge in terms of positioning strategies that came up several times in the course of the presentation. Uh, and, and figuring out how to develop concrete policies for pursuing that kind of positioning, uh, bridging role with the international community, uh, I think is an interesting challenge. And I'm, I'm just curious, I know that that is likely to be a part uh, of the conversation between President Park and President Obama, uh, but I don't yet know if there is a, uh, a coherent approach or whether this is really going to be more ad hoc and issue driven. Uh, and so I'd be interested in, you know, some additional uh, comment on that. Um, uh, a third issue that I think Wan Hyuk's presentation really uh, put into relief uh, is the South Korean domestic challenge of political polarization. Uh, and interestingly, I think the data that he showed about the 2002 and 2012 election results, you know, clearly show the um, the impact of democracy, demography on politics in a very direct way. Uh, and the question that it raises in my mind is, uh, especially given the kind of bumpy start that President Park seems to have had coming into office, uh, is um, under what circumstances should we be concerned about a kind of um, mad cow issue? Uh, that could incite public demonstrations in South Korea that's really connected with this political polarization issue. Um, and we know that the opposition uh, is pretty fragmented, but of course yesterday we know that Ancho also entered the National Assembly in the by-election. Uh, and so this is, I think, going to become, uh, it's, it's an issue that is sensitive, but I think it, it bears watching. Uh, and it certainly challenges uh, Madam Park to um, show a, uh, a rapid learning curve on that set of issues. And I think what uh, one had reported in terms of, of that, you know, is, is potentially positive. But we also know that um, it, one of the ways in which President Park seems to be very unique as a Korean is that she seems to be a bit of a loner. Uh, and so um, it, it'll be fascinating, I think, to watch that. Um, the economic issues that Wan Hyuk talked about, um, in some respects, my impression is that a lot of those issues, to a greater extent than any of the other uh, areas that I've talked about, are really Korea grappling with the same issues that we're grappling with in the broader global economy. Um, but um, 
South Korea does have a particular challenge, I think. Wonhyuk talked a lot about rates, but I wonder whether uh, optimal growth rates for South Korea. Uh, but I wonder whether we ought to focus more on what is the paradigm uh, or what is the model for South Korean growth going forward. Uh, and, you know, President Park mentioned in her uh, inaugural address the phrase creative economy. Uh, I was encouraged by that because it suggests uh, a focus on innovation. Um, but the challenge of actually doing that, uh, especially um, together with the other uh, inequality challenges that you pointed to, uh, it seems to me, is going to be formidable. Um, and then I think you made a very good case for why uh, President Park, uh, fifthly, is focusing on um, uh, trying to address uh, socioeconomic inequities. Um, uh, and actually, in the paper, I thought it was fascinating some of the measures that have been passed in the National Assembly related to um, protection or regulating of uh, SMEs. And I think you should say more about that uh, in the Q&A as well. Uh, but, you know, my impression is that one reason why South Korea has been slow to develop a social safety net is really related to the big North Korea question uh, and the challenge fiscally of potentially integrating North Korea after you've built in those social welfare standards. Uh, and so I'm just curious to know how you see the intersection of, of, of those issues. Uh, and then lastly, the North Korea issue that kind of hangs over everything. Um, the big question that I have uh, there uh, that I think is increasingly salient, and I'm hoping you can give a more positive answer than the one that I feel like uh, uh, is emerging, um, is the question, is there a path to peaceful coexistence on the peninsula? Or is North Korea's system and its perpetual need for crisis likely to block the possibility f of, of, of getting to a greater sense of stability uh, without, um, uh, you know, uh, in a non-peaceful way? Um, and I actually think that um, the Bush and Obama administrations have been very clear on um, red lines, especially regarding proliferation. Uh, but the f main focus and concern, in my view, has really been, and, and where that kicks in, is on nuclear terrorism, uh, where I think that the uh, two administrations are, have been consistent and very explicit. Um, I think that uh, one of the interesting challenges uh, that we're facing now uh, that is really interesting is just related to, to Kaesong and, and, you know, this um, – South Korean ultimatum uh, to North Korea to come to negotiations, you know, is really interesting and potentially a, um, a kind of turning point, I think, because, you know, Kaesong has symbolized the, um, you know, one area where North and South Korea have continued to work together. Uh, and I'm just concerned that if that um, ends up falling apart, um, it could really have the impact of changing people's perceptions of what is possible uh, with North Korea. And so I'd be very interested in your, you know, drawing that out a little bit more in terms of giving us a sense of, you know, should we see Kaesong as a, a real potential turning point in uh, not only Korean government policy, but public perceptions of what is possible with North Korea. And if we start to move in this other direction, um, you know, what are the implications for how the Park administration would uh, think about framing uh, a policy in an environment where it doesn't seem like there is really much of a toehold uh, for um, uh, developing trust or concrete areas of cooperation? So that's just a set of issues um, that I thought were um, raised uh, in the course of uh, Wanyuk's presentation. Um, uh, they also cover a lot of ground, so I'm sure you're not going to be able to answer, you know, all of those. Uh, but, uh, you know, just as a way of trying to draw out some of the questions uh, that I think were most salient, I wanted to lay those out and uh, then um, uh, have us move into a discussion period. Thanks.
you, Scott, for that um, very thorough uh, response to uh, Dr. Lim's presentation. I just wanted to make uh, one quick note before we, uh, Dr. Lim has an opportunity to respond to Scott's uh, uh, presentation discussion. Uh, uh, as, uh, Dr. Lim referred to his, his slides and his paper. We're going to have the opportunity, uh, we'll have those available as PDF files, so if, if any of you are interested, we'll, we'll certainly email them to you, so they'll be made available to you. So, so some of this data and some of the insights that he referred to, uh, they'll be uh, sent to you uh, uh, after this program. Uh, so with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. Lim to give him a few moments to respond to Scott's uh, Response. Yeah. Well, I think you nicely. Can you hear me? You, you nicely summarized the uh, presentation and uh, raised uh, six big questions, as you said. And uh, uh, the first one, I think, is the toughest one. Uh, I, I laid out four potential scenarios for Asia, and there's quite a bit uh, Korea can do, but a lot depends on, as you said, what its neighbors do. And I think. Uh, what Korea has to do is to try and get a, a, a framework where regional cooperation would take pl place, but it would be inclusive of the United States. And uh, uh, that's why East Asian Summit approach, you know, ASEAN 10 uh, plus Northeast Asian 3 uh, plus, you know, uh, 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 India, uh, Australia, New Zealand plus uh, 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 United States and uh, and and Russia. That kind of approach is much better than uh, a, an approach that's exclusive of one or the other, right? RCEP or uh, TPP. But as you said, as you said, a lot depends on its neighbors. And uh, you know, these days, uh, given what's going on in Japan, uh, we have some concerns. I, I'm, I'm not a critic of uh, of. Uh, Abenomics. I, I think it has uh, its its own logic, and uh, raising the inflation target from one percent to two percent is very uh, very sensible given the deflationary pressure that Japan has been fighting with. Uh, but uh, there's a sense that uh, Prime Minister Abe is interested in economic revival, not per se, but using that as a way of uh, making Japan sort of a normal country and uh, and. Uh, have a have a, a confront, confrontational uh, approach to uh, China, and I don't know how that'll uh, how that'll uh, play out. I mean, people who have uh, the the who has some memory of uh, 2006 and so on, you hear about the arc of uh, uh, democracy and prosperity that uh, Abe championed then too. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with the, what the neighbors do here as far as the as, as far as the middle power world is concerned I think much of it would be ad hoc in practice right but I I was hoping I, I hope that uh, there would be much more coherent ap approach to uh, middle power diplomacy because the I mean it, on the global stage Korea has been, uh, schizophrenic uh, in, in some sense on trade and climate change issues. It's uh, trying to take up the uh, 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 take up or benefit from the uh, developing country status and then you know you switch over to a different forum and take up an advanced economy uh, uh, position and so on. So uh, I, I hope uh, Korea actually looks at its own uh, development tra trajectory and carves out a much more honest interlocutor role. So for instance, for climate change, not only would you point out that since 2004, emerging countries are producing more uh, greenhouse gases, uh, annual terms and so on, but as far as the uh, historical emissions, cumulative emissions are concerned, uh, advanced economies have some responsibility as well. So, it, you know, a lot of uh, recent uh, recent debate has been you know, uh, has been uh, on how to uh, reframe the uh, climate change negotiation. But on things like that, I hope Korea takes a more principled position looking at the historical experience rather than uh, expediency, per se. And for domestic political uh, pol uh, polarization, I don't think there's a med cow issue per, uh, at, at this moment. But one thing that's uh, that's quite clear from the election result is the 
is the seeding uh, generational conflict possibility. So that uh, boiled over a little bit with a debate on the uh, basic pension. So uh, during the campaign, uh, President Park uh, said that you know, Korea's uh, uh, elderly people suffer from a much higher rate of poverty uh, than the national average, and, and, uh, and to say nothing of the OECD average. So she wanted to address uh, old life uh, poverty problem, which, which made a lot of sense. But then the, the policy she adopted was to actually uh, give, uh, you know, 200,000 won, which is about um, uh, twenty dollars uh, to uh, two hundred dollars or so each month to everyone, uh, every old person, and I mean, in order to address old age poverty, uh, it would be effective to focus on uh, poor people among the elderly rather than you know Egon He, who's uh, who's old but who, who's is very rich as well. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, on issues like that, young people, especially through a, a sh uh, you know, the, the uh, internet and so on, are voicing their uh, discontent. And if she's not careful, if uh, President Park is not careful about uh, pension issues, where you know, with uh, pay as you go, there's a built-in a generational conflict. If you're not careful, uh, she may uh, trip over something. Uh, so that's the that's one area that I'm concerned about uh, uh, with respect to domestic political po uh, polarization. As far as uh, mad cow like issue is concerned, you know, back in 2008, um, I think what triggered it was, uh, was the impression that President Lee gave during his visit to the United States that he was willing to do sort of fast track on ha health issues and all that just to achieve a breakthrough in, uh, through in the uh, FTA negotiation with the United States, putting uh, Korean people's uh, health concerns uh, secondary to the successful negotiation of the FTA. And that really uh, upset a lot of people, including, you know, mothers and, uh, and fathers and not only, not only just the people in their uh, 20s and so on. So unless uh, President Park Geun-hye does something similar to that, and uh, and uh, it, uh, tries to sort of uh, minimize uh, health concerns on the domestic voters to achieve something foreign policy wise. I don't think there really is a mad cow problem, and I don't think she's the type of uh, President Park is the type of person who would place uh, uh, you know FTA accomplishment or foreign policy uh, breakthrough ahead of. Uh, uh, Korean people's health and uh, security. So I, I don't see that happening with uh, President Park Geun-hye. For uh, economics, um, you mentioned creative economy, and uh, uh, we have a lot of debate going on uh, uh, here in, uh, uh, on this issue because the definition is not clear, uh, the cre uh, creative economy. But when we uh, say creative, uh, we usually think of uh, three things, uh, things like creative destruction, Okay, Schumpeterian uh, uh, notion where you have innovation but also very strong competition. Okay, uh, there are creative industries, mostly uh, cultural industries, uh, uh, having to do with uh, intellectual property and so on. And finally, um, uh, creation of new knowledge. Okay, and what she seems to be uh, emphasizing is some combination, but she's, President uh, Park Geun-hye is uh, sort of going back and forth uh, among different notions, and she, in fact, had to give a definition of the creative economy in one of her, uh, one of her meetings with government officials, and she said, uh, creative economy is an economy that places priority in, on creativity and tries to create new value added through the convergence and fusion of science and technology uh, and uh, ICT, information co uh, communication technology, as well as, uh, uh, as well as industry and culture. And uh, it, she, she gave a very broad definition, but there the notion of like competition, creative uh, disruption and so on is not so strong. But at the same time, if you emphasize a convergence or fusion of industry and, and, uh, and culture, 
and you go with the notion of uh, things like uh, produce a uh, uh, prosumer as a uh, uh, advanced by Alvin Toffler, a uh, Toffler, right? You, uh, consumers have a way of uh, 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 can influence the production of goods by insisting on uh, tailor-made uh, uh, goods and services, and they can uh, provide some input into the production process. And that process, uh, if structured that way, does not require uh, only the. It, it doesn't just. Uh, it doesn't just uh, depend on high-tech. Uh, stuff. Uh, it actually requires very good feedback uh, 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 in interaction back and forth between producers and consumers and so on. And in that sense, creative economy may not be uh, may not be uh, incompatible with uh, improving uh, social cohesion and so on. If consumers get to play such a role there, but it's still. Uh, it's still uh, in its initial stage or early stage as, a, as an economic paradigm or model. And for socioeconomic inequities uh, like SMEs and stuff, there, there are measures, as I mentioned in my paper, things like protecting the property rights, intellectual property rights of the SMEs uh, that, uh, that are being passed by the National Assembly. And finally, with respect to North Korea, I think there's a path to peaceful coexistence, but there's going to be a lot of turbulence uh, down the road. And I think starting with the three no's, as uh, proposed by Sikh Hacker, I think it's important to resume dialogue. And as far as uh, Kaesong Industrial Complex is concerned, it still is a source of great pride, uh, not only for South Korea, but also for North Korea, given that it's a you know, legacy project for Kim Jong-il. Um, uh, to get uh, Kaesong Industrial Complex up and uh, going again. So I hope uh, we can work things out, but it's going to take a lot of, uh, a lot of patience uh, and, uh, and diplomacy. And, uh, and you know, over the past 10 years or so, the uh, emotional undertone of the uh, negotiation uh, between the United States and North Korea, South Korea and North Korea, has, uh, has, has changed so much for the worse. So you almost have to hold your nose while you know, trying to negotiate something with North Korea. But I still think there's a path to uh, peaceful coexistence. Great. Well, thank you very much for that response. I want to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. We only have about 20 minutes. So what I would like to do is actually get three questions at a time. So hopefully that will give you some time to kind of think about the questions as each people ask the question. So if you can uh, identify yourself and then uh, keep your questions brief so we can get as many questions. But there's one, two, three. Let's do that. Let's start from here. Go ahead, Richard. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Go ahead. We'll, we'll right, take all uh, three of yes, you. Yes, anyway. Dave is your private consultant. I was just wondering uh, what the sentiments in Korea might be right now considering the uh, accession of Japan to the TPP process, whether that becomes a new priority uh, consideration in Korea. Okay. Uh, Richard Shin, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I just want to have a, I have a quick question about North Korea. You, know, you, you mentioned North Korea developing military and also trying you know, do economic prosperity, just like the Israel model. But unfortunately, they have neither, uh, in a sense. Um, so they're in a catch-22. If they give up nuclear weapons, maybe we'll treat them better, but down the road, there's a lot of uncertainty. Right. If they keep nuclear weapons, then they're treated as a bastard child, and, and you know they're never going to get economic prosperity. So how can North Korea get out of that trap? And then, as for the US, um, you mentioned the US and China possibly cutting a deal that will concern North Korea. Now, you know that Secretary Kerry visited China, and there seems to be some talks about the U.S. giving more deference to China uh, for solving this nuclear problem with North Korea. And I don't know whether you had thought about the implications for that, uh, implications of that uh, for North, uh, South Korea. Thank you. Uh, after the Vietnam War and the invasion of, of Vietnam by China, the only problem in the is uh, in the in East China, in East uh, Asia, was the possible war between uh, China and Taiwan. But now we have this problem with the South Sea, uh, in in with this famous nine dots uh, map, 
<laughs> you have also the, the problem within China, Taiwan still, but maybe it's the less risky now. You have this problem within Japan and China. Even Japan was saying that it will fire against any ship like China. And of course, you have this huge problem of, of the Korea. I mean, this situation looks very, very serious. If just one bullet is fired between Vietnam and China, or, or Japan and China, or between the Koreas, you will have the most difficult crisis of the 21st century in the world. And even the, the European crisis, economic crisis, would be nothing compared with uh, a collapse of the, of the East uh, Asian economy. Uh, has this worst case scenario has been analyzed? Uh, just if I can do another very quick. Uh, it, it, the possibilities between Korea, the, the, the options, one could be uh, well, a conventional war between the, within the two. The other, that uh, North Korea trying to launch this uh, nuclear uh, uh, against uh, uh, South Korea. Or the other is just blackmail. I mean, blackmail the US, blackmail the Japan and, and Korea. But maybe there is a fourth possibility. Is uh, China is the only country that has some real influence in North Korea? And has been analyzed the possibility of a coup d'etat uh, promoted by China uh, that to, to present to have a, a puppet state in North Korea? And because China will never accept uh, the unification of, of Korea, like in Germany. Uh, but could that be possibility uh, analyzed or has been discussed? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, the first question with respect to Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, with Japan's succession, whether Korea is uh, going to put more emphasis on this. Well, you have to look at all these uh, bilateral trade relations because Korea now already has uh, an FTA with the United States. TPP is not really a, a, a key priority. One uh, missing bilateral uh, trade relation uh, that Korea has is with China and is with Japan. So with TPP, there's a possibility of, uh, you know, uh, Korea-Japan uh, a trade agreement in a, in a, through a backdoor way, but we already have a trilateral, uh, you know, Korea, China, Japan, uh, T, uh, FT, uh, 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 free trade uh, agreement uh, negotiation going on and so on. So TPP is not really a priority item uh, for Korea. I, but at the same time, given that it already has a, a, an FTA with the United States, Korea is, you know, quite ready to join the uh, TPP <coughs> whenever, uh, whenever you know, circumstances right and, uh, ripe and stuff. So there's not much nervousness with uh, TPP now, including Japan. Um, and it's not really a big uh, news item among, among uh, ordinary people. For uh, uh, Dr. Shin's question, I think North Korea's question, uh, North Korea's uh, calculation is that much like uh, Pakistan, um, you know, and, and uh, India and so on, I think what they want to do is have deterrence that would uh, be effective even with another, you know, uh, another installment of a Bush, Bush-like administration in the United States, so to speak. So given what happened to uh, what happened under the Bush administration and given what happened to Gaddafi in Libya after giving up the nuclear bomb and stuff, that they think uh, they can somehow work, work out a, a deal with the United States where some nuclear capability would be accepted. But it may not be a full-fledged you know, nuclear weapon state, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and at the same time, given that uh, freeze of the nuclear capability, uh, they think they'll be able to work out some, uh, you know, improved relations with the outside world, where economic prosperity, economic development, could be a uh, could be a realistic pursuit. And for U.S.-China deal on North Korea, I think at the end of the day, I, I think the past, the the chances are quite low. I, I, I talked about the nightmare nightmare scenario, but I I think the prob probability is very low. And outsourcing U.S. diplomacy to China hasn't really worked. And in many ways, it has strengthened China's hand in North Korea. But at the same time, given the history of Korea, you know, fighting against the Chinese for uh, centuries, and the fact that North Korea's top leadership really consists of a very tight-knit, you know, families, 
that have a shared experience of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, pro-independence struggle and so on. I don't know who they can really realistically install as a, a pro-Chinese uh, prodigy uh, after a coup d'etat. And uh, I, I think China w is not likely to go as far as that. So, so, so I think at the end of the day, the possibility of a U.S.-China deal on North Korea still remains quite low, but uh, the nightmare scenario is still out there. Uh, so that's, that's why we, we are concerned in Korea with respect to that. And for the, the last question with uh, you know, territorial issues and, and so on, um, this, is a, this is an interesting issue, and I, I think you will have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, attention, uh, uh, you'll have a lot of tension down the road. And if you think about it, uh, when the United States came to join the uh, East Asian Summit, uh, one of the key, key issues it put on the table is uh, maritime security, naval security. And there, the United States has an important role to play as a stabilizer in the region. And I think uh, Southeast Asian countries appreciate that. And uh, with you know, US naval presence, uh, and uh, Chinese uh, Chinese need to also maintain some you know good relations uh, with its neighbors. I think uh, I think tension can be managed there, and even with uh, uh, Japan, China, Japan, Korea issues, uh, I think there's a limit to how much Japan can push. In fact. I had that sense uh, last year after you know President Lee Myung Bak's visit to Tokyo, and uh, and there was a lot of uh, tension between uh, Korea Japan relations. But then there was some tension between China and Japan relations immediately afterwards, and there was a sense that you know Japan cannot take on both China and Korea at the same time. In fact, uh, I felt that they toned down their rhetoric towards South Korea uh, as, as soon as uh, China-Japan uh, tension began to really fl uh, flare up. So I think it can be managed uh, down the road. Mm -hmm. Let's take one additional set. Right here, right here, and then one third in the back. So. Thanks for very interesting remarks. Uh, and a question about uh, labor relations, and uh, I guess this maybe broadly applies to the uh, social safety net issue. So I wonder what uh, generally uh, you think we might see uh, from the Park administration uh, in, in terms of um, labor issues. And very specifically, as you probably know, there's this pending issue um, among uh, the auto workers uh, regarding whether the basis of overtime pay and uh, severance would, uh, would include uh, bonus compensation, which is as much as half of the uh, total compensation for, for all the workers, you know, if so. Uh, that would have very big implications potentially for, for all workers in Korea. Thank you. Louise Van Horn, a former Peace Corps volunteer who was there when probably before Dr. Wynn was born. <laughs> I'm also a social worker, a return, uh, former social worker, and uh, a member of the North Korea Freedom Coalition. And I have two questions. Um, I can brief. Uh, number one, I understand there's a lot of talk about uh, income and quality in North Korea, but I'm wondering what is really being done. Now, we in North Korea, in, income inequality. In South Korea. Okay. In South Korea, I'm sorry, I said North Korea. <laughs> in South Korea. And also, as you know, this is an issue that we in the United States are really struggling mightily with as well. Um, I wonder whether you have examined, because you are a culturally homogeneous population, I think you have a better shot at actually achieving um, income equality uh, from a political standpoint than what we do here in the United States. And I wonder whether you have looked at other cultures and examined uh, that are culturally more homogeneous and looked at ways that uh, they are trying to do this. Now, at some point, I don't know, I haven't followed it very closely, but it used to be that Japan was much more, had much, had, had achieved much more inequality than uh, South Korea. I don't know now, somebody in this room probably knows. Uh, the other question I have, uh, I don't get it. <laughs> Why is it that the, uh, the quote left, and I've heard the left in uh, South Korea, uh, supports North Korea? Are they aware that there are 200,000, up to 200,000 
people live in, in horrible circumstances and almost and being killed in uh, these gulags. And does anybody in South Korea care about that? I know it's a terrible uh, uh, um, to think about uh, reunification must be just so very, very, very frightening to South Koreans. And I, I really respect that concern and what it, how it might affect your country. But do you have any dreams to try to help the, the North Korean people? Great, thank you. Third question? Okay. Um, hello, my name is JJ Kat Fon. I'm, I'm a junior scholar at the Wilson Center. Um, well, although I still feel that the Korea can fall into a middle income trap, um, according to World Bank categorization, um, North, South Korea is in the high income status. And I think it's due to the um, Korea's innovation-led development. And what I want to know is that what policy or what kind of aspect that contributed the most for the Korea's um, success in technological front? Great, great. Three great questions. Okay. For the first question on uh, labor and social security, I, I think Korea's due for some fundamental change in the uh, uh, wage system because what's going on now is that given the uh, existing seniority based wage uh, all the workers become um, much more costly uh, than their productivity uh, can uh, can handle uh, when they go past 50 uh, whatever so they are forced to uh, basically retire early and then they you know open up uh, pizza parlors, uh, chicken uh, chicken places, and so on. So, the uh, share of self self employed uh, self employment in Korea is almost twice the uh, OECD average, and uh, and also it, it also has some effect on female labor participation. In that, you know, unlike uh, most uh, most OECD countries, Korea has a has an M pattern for for uh, female labor participation because it, uh, even in you know Scandinavian countries they they when they are when women are at child rearing age they reduce their working hours okay so e even if you you know promote gender equality and stuff at the end of the day when you have to take care for young very young children uh, as mothers they reduce their working hours but they do not uh, the Scandinavian workers for instance do not drop out of the workforce altogether and then come back three years later. They, they have flexible uh, workouts that way. Korea is not like that. And I think uh, something has to be done on seniority wage and, uh, and uh, rigid uh, working hours to get at the many of the labor and social security problems that Korea has. And you mentioned uh, older workers and so on. but. I, I think that has to be considered in the overall, you know, lifetime earning uh, framework and how productivity should be linked to uh, productivity, uh, the, the, the wages, rather than uh, rather than, you know, uh, promote uh, age uh, age based uh, seniority wages uh, and so on. And for the second question, uh, income inequality in South Korea. Um, Korea's market based income uh, inequality is not so bad, but Korea doesn't make much of a dent between uh, before tax inequality and after tax inequality. So I, I think at the end of the day, there has to be more progressivity in taxation, and you know, uh, uh, taxes will have to be raised so that some uh, income redistribution takes place uh, for for to address this problem. This is not. A, that's such a popular position in Korea, you know, just like in every country, that people uh, do not like uh, higher taxes. But if you look at actually the OECD figures and how different countries have uh, advanced over time, I think something has to be on the ta uh, to be done on the tax side if Korea is to address income inequality. Um, and for North Korean question, 
Um, I was in, uh, I was involved in, with the uh, Korean NGO, Korea uh, Buddhist Sharing Movement, or later became Good Friends, uh, back in the late 1990s uh, with the, the refugees uh, due to the uh, food crisis that was going on in North Korea. Uh, I, I, I cannot speak for, for all South Koreans, but it's not that we don't care about what's going on in North Korea, but we, uh, at least I think, the, the uh, sort of, uh, you know, civil society approach to North Korea where you just target the gulags or uh, target refugees or so on, have its, uh, have its limits, okay? I think what has to take place is uh, changes on the ground in North Korea and in order to do that, you have to have much more greater cooperation between South Korea and North Korea to change uh, the economy in North Korea so that uh, income will be generated and there will be greater pressure for transparency and so on in North Korea. Otherwise, you, are just, you just wind up just uh, you know, uh, collecting stories about gulags and refugees and so on and try to help out those people. That's important in itself. But in order to uh, trigger a transformational change within North Korea, I think that approach is uh, limited. And, and finally, with respect to the middle-income trap, uh, the middle-income trap scenario, uh, as presented by the uh, Asia Development Bank, mainly involves uh, China, you know, uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, and so on. And uh, as you mentioned, Korea went beyond uh, the middle-income trap and uh, joined the uh, high-income countries, and key to that was, uh, was two, in my view. Uh, Export-oriented industrialization that continued to expand the value chain. So uh, instead of just importing uh, raw materials and machinery from overseas and just uh, using cheap domestic labor to produce labor-intensive manufacturers, Korea actually looked at the value chain from uh, R&D all the way to marketing and branding and try to fill in the missing links and move to the high value added rate areas along the value chain. And key to that, as you pointed out, was, uh, was R&D on, uh, on the one hand and the uh, uh, innovation, uh, 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 competition, I should say. Uh, and what happened was that back in you know, uh, 1970, uh, R&D expenditure as a percentage of GDP was uh, less than 0.5 in Korea. And about 80% of that was borne by the public sector, with uh, government research institutes being set up as part of the uh, heavy and chemical industry drive and so on. But then uh, with Korean private sector companies exposed to global competition, uh, they uh, began to realize that innovation really holds the key for their continued prosperity, and they began to engage in their own innovation and R&D. So by 1982, uh, private sector achieves achieve parity with the public sector in R&D spending, and overall uh, spending for Korea on R&D reached 1% uh, of uh, GDP, and it's now at 4% of GDP, uh, greater than 4% of GDP, and uh, three quarters of that is borne by the private sector. And key to that was the recognition that in order to go beyond the uh, middle income trap, you have to have your own innovation, uh, technical expertise, and so on. But at the same time, rather than just uh, investing in R&D resources, there was, a, there was an economic regime that was uh, based on the idea of performance-based rewards. That is, either government support or market support would be based on your performance in the uh, competitive global market, and successful uh, experiments would be reinforced positively by this mechanism. And key part of that was the need for innovation in order for companies like Samsung, LG, and Hyundai to go forward. So this dynamic process was the one that helped uh, Korea to overcome the uh, middle-income trap. And in many developing countries, what typically happens is that they invite foreign direct investors uh, and set up, uh, set up uh, labor-intensive manufacturing operations, but they do not strengthen human resources, infrastructure, and R&D capabilities uh, that could propel the nation behind, uh, beyond the uh, uh, labor-intensive manufacturing. So when wages begin to rise, these, uh, these uh, 
uh, foreign investors look for cheaper places to uh, to uh, do their operations, and often these countries are left in the uh, middle income trap. So I think that was the difference uh, in Korea's economic development experience. Well, thank you very much. I think you, all of you got a glimpse of the breadth of knowledge that Dr. Lim brings to the table. Uh, thank you very much for that comprehensive view of uh, Korean politics and economics. And please help me uh, thank Dr. Lim for his comments today.